Salve Regina Gloria. Salve Maria, dear friends. Uh, welcome back to our reflection on the Sunday readings. Today we are going to talk about the 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time, year A. Uh, this, the readings of today center about the problem of who is my neighbor? Uh, my, because uh, it, it all has to do, both the Gospel and the, uh, the true readings have to do with this problem. The Gospel gives you the, the theoretical doctrine. In other words, uh, um, when I, a Pharisee or one of the uh, Jewish teachers asked our Lord, then uh, uh, you must love, uh, he says, which commandment of the law is the greatest? And our Lord says, you shall love your Lord, your Lord God with your whole mind, with your whole heart, with your whole soul, and your neighbor as thyself. These two commandments contain the whole of the law of the prophets. Therefore, he is giving the doctrine of the neighbor, who is the neighbor. And then the, uh, the two readings, one is from the book of Exodus, uh, from, from, and the other is the, uh, the letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, give examples of who is the neighbor. Uh, in the first one in the book of Exodus, our Lord speaks about uh, how he loves those who serve him. And those who do a wrongdoing to uh, his neighbor, they are punished by him very, very severely. Where he says, I will use the sword and, and, and kill you, kill this person who does a thing like that. And they will remain off, their, their children will remain orphan and their wives will remain a widow, you see. And, and, uh, and the second one, is a letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. He is actually a, a not a, so, so, so to speak, a negative one, but a positive one, because he says, uh, a reference, because he says, uh, uh, re you are an example for those neighboring countries around you, the neighboring communities around you, because you followed what I taught you. Uh, you followed that and you were very good, and you, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, and you stopped adoring idols and adored God. And he was, he was speaking about himself, but he praised these people. And he let it know by what would be the contrary to that, that if they didn't do this, they would fall into the category which is mentioned in the first reading. In other words, they'd be subject to the anger of God. So, uh, now, um, this might seem, especially the first reading might seem in a present day context, a, a bit exaggerated because uh, a person could say, well, just for wronging uh, the, uh, the, uh, my neighbor or something like that, he'd be, be killed and by be used the sword, God will use the sword against him, you see. It seems a bit exaggerated. But then you have to understand the following. The Gospels give you an outline which, which the, the tradition of the Church and the exegetes have, have worked on for centuries. This, they, they say the following, that the degree of the, the uh, violence and the strength of the punishment has to do with the love God has for the person who was a victim. In other words, the more that person was loved by God, the more he is close to God, uh, the more will be the anger of God if that person is wronged. And that gives, justifies, uh, justifies the violence of the uh, punishment which is mentioned in the first reading, you see. Uh, because this has a relationship to do directly with God. Uh, thus we have an understanding of the relationship between the Gospel, the first and the second reading. There is therefore a relativity, a proximity of the others have in relation to me and the, uh, the, the, paramet the parameter of this, the, 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 the measurement of this is God and not myself. Uh, in other words, if the person is close to God or not. For example, when God talks about the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus talks about the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, the man who is best there is the one who is closer to God. Who is that? The Good Samaritan, because he represented God to the man who had been injured by the robbers. But, and he, he took him to his own, he gave him his own animal, he took him to, a, to an inn, and he had him taken care of, and he, 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 filled his, he took care of his wounds and he gave money to the innkeeper to take care of him when he was leaving and when, until he came back. You see, so he represented God to the Samaritan. So therefore the good person there is, is the Samaritan. Uh, however, this is the, the greater this person is union to God is, it measures the degree of the violence of the punishment. An example, Moses. 
uh, when she spoke badly of the person who was chosen by God, who was Moses, who at that time was practically an ambassador of God on this earth, he was one of the greatest of the prophets, perhaps the greatest of the prophets of the Old Testament, you see, and his sister spoke bad of him. She was immediately transformed in, with a terrible leprosy because this man was the representation of God for the people and should have been respected as such, should be respected as such. Of course, Moses was the leader of the, of the chosen race, brought them out of Egypt, uh, in front of the, the Pharaoh, he and his brother, Aaron, etc., etc., and all the things which you can read about in the book of Exodus, you see. Now, for example, it is good to also to mention people perhaps who are closer to us of our own day, who were very much loved by God and were maltreated, were badly treated by the, their own contemporaries. And there are many examples of this in the lives of the saints. If you study the lives of the saints, you will see that many of them, the worst persecutors, the worst enemies, were those who were in the closest entourage, who were in the closest proximity to them, who lived with them, who heard about them like that. Why is that? Because these people lived, they, are not, they, they ceased to be just ordinary people, but it, persons who lived in the proximity and under the influence of a saint. You could talk about St. Teresa of Avila, who suffered this from her own contemporaries, from her own nuns. Uh, St. John of the Cross also, who was put into jail because he wanted to participate with her, with the reform of the Carmelite order. He was put into jail by the, by the, 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 the Carmelites who didn't want that, you see. And he had to escape. Uh, and there are many other examples. Father Pio, for, uh, and why we were saying this, because people who are close to these saints, you see, receive graces constantly to God. Open your heart to the saint, and they refuse. Open your heart to the saint, and they refuse. Every time they refuse, they're rejecting God and they become worse, they become worse. The opposite is true. If they accept the grace of God, they will become better, they will sanctify themselves. But in the case of Father Pio, a very interesting thing happened. He was detested by some of his close, he was a, we know the history of Father Pio, he was an absolute saint, a marvelous man, a martyr of confessions. He would stay hours in the confessionals. San Giovanni Rotondo became the uh, confessional center of the world. But people came from all over the world, all over Europe, just to go to confession with him. And there were many cases where he wouldn't even receive the people. Go away, go clean yourself, come back later. You are full of sin, I won't confess you, no. And people who are, who are, who are, who are scandalous like that. And he was not loved by the authorities of his own convent, then when he moved to San Giovanni Rotondo. And when he died, he was laid in state like that. And before he died, a certain time before he died, he lived, I believe it was in San Giovanni Rotondo, which is a huge a hospital and a huge convent with a row, absolute row of windows, enormous quantities of windows on the facade. And uh, the people who loved him dearly, these followers, would always be with him during the day, would follow him during his mass. His mass, every mass of his lasted about two hours. In the end, when they left the house, he would always come to his window of his cell and say good night to them, you see. And this was something that was much looked forward to by his followers and saints. So after he died, they left the church, they left the, the, the chapel, they left the building and said, now, what are we going to do? We cannot say good night anymore to Father Pio. Oh, Father Pio, how sad is like that. And they stood at the same place which they normally would stand where they received his greeting at night, you see. And then the superior came out and said, uh, no, no more, Father Pio is no more, there'll be no good night tonight. And blam, closed the, the blind of the window violently. What did the saint do? All of the windows of the facade opened and each one there was a figure of Father Pio saying good night to them. He did a miracle which of course the Italians were absolutely enthused to think like that. All of the windows of the facade opened up and there was Father Pio in each one of the windows saying good night to them, uh, overcoming the hatred of the man who didn't want them to receive any more a good night and the influence of the saint. So that is, that is wonderful. So, so how, how, how God loved him and the punishment he must have reserved for a person who did what the superior did, you see. To end up, you see, what happens is when God sends not only, when God, what happens when God sends not only a chosen person that he loves dearly, but an institution that he finds, founds, uh, in this case, the church. And what happens when that institution is 
is despised, is rejected, is persecuted, is maltreated, is slandered, is uh, said, is represented, misrepresented as being doing things which the church would never do, etc., etc. Of course, you can imagine that his. Uh, uh, can you imagine the punishment that he is preparing for people or somebody who would do a thing like that? It's something tremendous, you see. This week, you have probably seen on the world media uh, pictures of churches being burnt. Uh, images, statues of saints being destroyed, generalized hatred against a divine institution, which is the Catholic Church. Uh, and we had this before our eyes during the whole of the week. What should we think about all of this? What would St. Paul say if he was present and witnessed such a thing like that? Uh, these are things that we could think about and remember when we consider the liturgy of this Sunday. So with that thought, my dear friends, I would, uh, with that food for thought, I might say, we would leave you with this thought, uh, asking that Our Lady bless you all and give you our final blessing. Uh, may Almighty God, through the intercession of His Blessed Mother, bless you and protect you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Salve Maria. <laughs>